It's a great pleasure having you on my own podcast today, Mr. Shagun Shoumi. So it's nice to be here. I like the ambience. <laughs> the studio thing looks so nice. Thank you so much. Should I say Chief Shagun Shoumi? Otumba, please. Otumba. <laughs> Thank you so much indeed. I appreciate uh, your Your great beards are making you look like an Otumba, really. The man with the money, isn't it? Every inch of it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Let's begin the conversation with um, what is happening in your party before I take your, you out of your party. Um, uh, there seems to be a whole lot happening. And I understand that recently you, you've you been moving around. You've been speaking to people, leaders in your party. Is it true you want to become the national chairman? So sure. remember we had this conversation some times back and I did tell you that young people are really speaking that look, she can come and lead, come and lead. I try to tell them that, look, our issues are not always replacing the man in charge or the man who sits in the office. And the more they spoke about it, the more I reflected on it and I realized that the fundamental change that you need to make happen in that in that space is the kind of thing that I can bring to the table. I realized that for an opposition party that has been around for like 25 years, having lost three elections back to back, or if you like, get cheated out of three elections back to back, Sometimes you have to look inward to see whether there's something that is misconnecting with the Nigerian people. There's enough anger in the land. So why is the opposition party not able to harvest it? And when you look through the space, you will realize that the entire gamut needs to change. You need to reform the party. You need to rewrite the playbook for the party. You need to do the differentiation between the ideological underpinnings of the party so that it can be slightly different or clearly different from other parties. As it is now, people can't even differentiate between the parties. That's why you see them jump in today and come back tomorrow. Then there's also the need for you to go to the field and speak to the owners of the party, this critical stakeholder. And I'm not talking about just the fat boys at the top of the pyramid. No, I'm talking about the ones that are lowly at the base of the pyramid and have been crisscrossing the country, thanking them for efforts put in, in the last one, speaking to them about not giving up on the country and the fact that democracy provides us with the opportunity to constantly be hopeful. And I've also been saying to them that hope is the greatest asset that we have as Nigerians, and that whatever we do, we must never lose hope. And I must, I must tell you, Shio, I am amazed at the level of expectation, support, desire, endorsement. People are just nudging me on, and I'm beginning to say, wow, you guys really want me to do this. So we'll see how it goes. I'm a process man. The party has to make some declarations. They have to tell us when they are ready. We have to look at all of the issues involved. But clearly, I'm the best man to lead them now. I'm a connect between the old and the young. I'm very, very, you know, knowledgeable on the subject matters. I've always believed in stylized campaigns. I believe that opposition is not just saying no. Opposition is explaining why that particular course of action of the ruling party is wrong and the alternative proposals that must be on the table. I find it extremely embarrassing that we are able to critique the federal government for whatever it is that the government is doing. And we're not able to see commensurate effort from the legislature, especially the opposition aspect of the legislature. We are not able to see like a big pushback from even the governors and the leaders of the ruling party. It's just a whole lot of laziness all around. And I intend to snap them out of that EGOC. For those who think that this is an article playbook. You know, I have a burden of, you know, being called an article man or article even if you want to be if you want to be mean you can even call me an article stooge but that's not true i was an ambassador man when he was the president of this country running up and down for the record i was the one who thought out of my head the concept of the you know this all progressive part all the other parties coming together it was called coplon then coalition of political party of night with them it and first the sweep that was me supporting the government at that time i was a jonathan man you recall after the Jonathan election had been lost in 2015, it was so hard getting anybody to even desire to even speak on behalf of PDP. And I was speaking and speaking and speaking and pushing and pushing. Before Atiku returned back to the party, I've always been a PDP man. I've been a week man. I've said to people that I'll run some 13 others for just one week. That does not mean that I'm a week man beyond that. But because Atiku has been presidential candidate back to back, and he has also been someone that I work very closely with, and Obviously, you can't speak about opposition responsibility 
without speaking about the. So you can be anybody's man. I am. So far, am, so far, he pays your he pays your bill because no, no, no. that's what the opposition are in your party are saying. No, listen, that's not true. I don't remember Ambassador ever being someone that likes to pay anybody's bills. You to be a person that stands with the political party is almost like you are standing with your tribe. Nobody pays you to stand for your tribe. Nobody pays you to defend your tribe. Nobody pays you to wear the jersey of your football club. Nobody pays you to be enthusiastic about even the foreign clubs you support. But if you do support a political party, I believe, I've been issue, that democracy is a long journey. It's a journey that requires a lot of painstaking effort to deepen it. And I believe in the consistency of staying in one place. There have been times that my confidence has been shaken. When I can do the maths and I can do the, you know, the statistical plotting and see that, oh, Shegun, you're going to play against the run of play. And my friends who have been jumping up and down to other parties, who's paying them? People go after what they are interested in. For me, I like to build to last. So if tomorrow morning somebody else is the presidential candidate of the party, if that is the will of the people, if I evaluate it and it doesn't come to unnecessary idiocy, I will support him. But one thing I always say to people, I can never speak for a man I have not engaged. The level of engagement I have with leaders, even before I start supporting them, journalists don't even ask them those kind of questions. I tear them apart and then couple them and pull them up and drag them down and all that. And the beauty about Atiku, more than most people, is that he has developed the democratic ability to just listen. To answer the questions if you ask it, not in a way as if like you're trying to be rude to him, to provide explanations on the issues that you're having. I'm not so sure this is a bit of a shade of gray. And you can look at his life beyond the Amit's version that comes with being in politics and the criticism of politics. You can look at his life and the signposts of what he's done. You can look at what he's done in education in some other sector. You can look at what he's done even in rural area. And you can, you know, I tell people, men like Atiku Abaka and a few of them that I'm now beginning to discover within that eighth grade, they, they represent the institutional memory of where this country was dreaming to go. They know when this country started out educating even they themselves by a public school, you know, funded by government. They know when this country peaked at the point when they had a lot of money during the oil boom. They know when this country was fighting tooth and need to get democracy. They have seen some of the democratic effort at play. And obviously, luckily, some of them are still available that they can see the mess that they have collectively created. Do you know what I always say like every time we say it? I always tell him, that's what your generation created. He will smile as okay, check I agree, but what it's your, I don't spare them. Because so I am uh, not just so, an article man. I am a PDP man, most of them. Mm. Time. I've had leaders who have left the party. She was not left the party, I didn't leave. Daniel was the first person to give me an appointment that could maybe give me some exposure. I was a special as deputy chief press secretary, senior special advisor, special assistant to him. He left the party. I'm here. I am I try to be fair. I try to be if I were wearing the jersey of APC. You'll be amazed at the kind of defense I've put up. Not just talking for the sake of talking. I do a lot of research. I read a lot. I take experiences from other places. I lay out the conversation in such a way that it's stylized. Trust me. So, so, the kind of so we have not seen the last from Atiku, for example. I don't the, know. I've always because told, there are those who believe that Atiku is coming back in 2027. I'll say it this way. I have said to him privately, you need to take that decision by yourself. No one should be responsible for pushing you, gouging you, dragging you into it. It's a very difficult and tedious exercise. It costs a lot of money, costs a lot of nerves. Go and reflect on it properly. Determine for yourself if you have the hunger and there's the need for you to do more. Or also determine for yourself whether you've come to the point where you now need to pass the baton to the next generation. But these are decisions you must take. You know why? Because first and foremost, the Constitution of the Federal Republic guarantees every Nigerian the right to contest. And you should not, in a bid to say you are creating something new, begin to bully people out of the rights that has already been freely given to all Nigerians. Sheung, why don't you think I should contest president in 2027? Why wouldn't you come and contest governor? Why wouldn't you contest anything? There's always enough numbers for everybody. So long as your appetite is there, your reasons are clear, your why is known, and the push and the hunger is there. Sheung, why wouldn't you? What, what, mm. So, so, so uh, Mr. Show me. The, mm. the, the question is, Atiku, for example, mm. A lot of people thought that he will leave the scene as as soon as the Supreme Court decided his fate 
in the 2023 election no, but that the fact that he sat back mm. and he says that he's not going to leave the party and in fact he's building a process to re to, to re-energize the party these are some of his plans so there are those who believe that Atiku Abubakar still has a plan for 2027 the body language and the Atiku you know do you think there's a possibility of Atiku return in 2027? I'll put it for you this way and I'll be straight up with you show every time you ask a question I give you the straight answer 2023 has shown that the Nigerian nation is in a fix. We have found ourselves in a situation where the tribes are so divided. The ones that have been adjudged to be the winners, although we, we, hold, we hold very strongly that, that we were done blue and we were done dirty, I mean the Nigerian citizen altogether, and we have seen that the direction of their government is at best sad you don't think that the tunubu government won free and i mean tunubu won free and square have, how could they have the supreme court said they so the appeal court said so do you know the thing about the courts the thing about the courts is that there are things that you call a perfect crime opportune moments where you just can't tie it properly and if you can't tie it properly the eyes of the judge can say i see this but i don't accept it and therefore the judiciary as they are now has lost the ability to make everybody in the country believe that when they make pronouncement, they make it in the overall best interest of the country. You cannot explain on the on the onion of legalese some of the things that you know, even as a child, would have never been tolerated in this country. For instance, you cannot say you went to a primary school and a secondary school that doesn't exist. You cannot say that the idea, your idea of sui generis is that you're not going to look for truth. You cannot say that the suffrage, which is the right given to the citizen in the democracy, will be taken away from them under all sorts of technical arrangement. You cannot say that a, an election body like INEC will be allowed to sidestep a promise he made, which it also wrote down in his you know, guidelines. You cannot say that people who ordinarily did not buy the form to contest for certain offices can pretend to be you cannot be confused as to what constitutes a pre-election matter and what is a re-election and, and you know a post-election matter you can't be confused with your judgment you can't write a judgment that people are reading and what you what you pronounced in court and what you what people are reading in your satisfied true copy are so far from them so no you can't be explaining all these things once you do that we can accept the finality of the supreme court decision but we can also say that if the parameters and the issues that requires attention in the country is as they are. It would be grossly irresponsible of Atiku Abubakar to just sail off into the sunset. So whereas he's here providing leadership in a very major democratic way, you never hear him call people to arm. You never hear him say things that are too hard for the nation. You will always, anytime he speaks, he offers some opinion. Even when he was talking about the court case, he offered reform of the judiciary and reform of the electoral process. I pray and ask you, should a political party and a candidate that does not win an election, should they automatically, you know, collapse into the ruling party? Or should they at least do the duty of opposition and provide leadership? And if that's what Atiku is doing, that's fine. And I say to everybody, 2027 God Sparing Alive is still very far down the road. At least three generations of people, people who are 15, people who are 16, and people who are 17, are going to be migrated into the electoral role. It's too early for anybody to say they're running for anything. But you can't rule Atiku out. Can you rule Bola Tinubu out for a second term? If you cannot rule Bola Tinubu out, then obviously you have to look at it properly and say, Atiku, if you have the energy and you still have the appetite, please, let's go have this conversation again, especially if the people in the country are this desperate. And truly, you know, everybody in Nigeria is desperate. Even and they need they, an article. Even That's they, what you think. No, no, no. They need, they need a reformer. They need someone who has the capability to get the job done. They need somebody who understands the concept of building for all of us. And they need somebody who will make sure that the tribal division in the country comes out. Have you gone through Twitter of late? I look at Twitter and I see how the young people of the tribes at each other's neck and I'm asking myself, is there anybody in charge of this country? For if there were people in charge of this country, you'd be wondering what the commissioner, what the minister of information, what the guy in charge of national orientation, what the national security agency, what they're doing. 
Do you know how long it takes before you start to have xenophobic attacks on people? All that needs to happen is for you to regularize tribes attacking themselves. Oh, I will not did this. This one did that. Your parents were naked. Our parents are this. How can leaders of society be laying claims to things that will be offensive in other people's homestead? People are, tribes are controlling the directive principles of their politics. The Igbos control the directive principle of their southeast politics. The House of Fulani, they control the directive principle of the south of their northern politics. Why would anybody, without due respect, begin to disrespect the Yorubas and expect that the Yorubas don't have a right to control the directive principles of their own region, of their own space? And when people are operating in that space, whether as, as indigenous or settlers or owners or even joint owners or even the people who taught it into existence, the reality is that you must be sensitive to the tribal or you know conclave of people. I won't come into the southeast and start to speak to them in a manner that, especially when I'm living there, as though, oh, I'm the one who, no, that's not it. And it's going at a speed that is getting too dangerous. Mm. I'm seeing that more and more people are sitting on it, and we need to tell young people enough. Nigeria is more divided online than it is physically. It, it, that's, the, that's the painful thing, but you know the thing about... And it's, the, it's a dangerous trend, is Very it? dangerous, you know, very dangerous. I, I ask myself that, what, who are these people leading this country? Do they even understand what they what we're likely going to potentially deal with? Imagine if over a, gener a period of about five years, the narrative of tribal hate continues. Can you just imagine how what an army of people that would all be hating themselves, not even loving their country? I get where you want to criticize the government, but you can't reduce it to a tribal issue. Especially if you are even talking about President Bolatinubu. What is in Bolatinubu's profile actions cabinet that tells you that this is what the Yorubas want. At best, you say he's running the government for himself and his cronies and probably his family members. Which leader in Yoruba land can tell you that, oh, I nominated somebody into Bolatinubu's cabinet? So why would you now say, because the Yoruba man is president, some of us campaign very vigorously to tell you, let's look another way, and then you're going to say that because of that one man, you're going to cause a crisis between the tribe, and you're, you're the ones fighting the houses, when you're not fighting the outside, you're attacking the Europeans. You still think that there is nepotism in the Bolatinubu's government? I think that... Because you once owed that yeah, view. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but over the time, have you changed your mind okay, tell about me, it? Tell me why I would change my mind. When I'm complaining that you are putting all the... You are putting finance, you are putting all of those... You know, agencies that control the money and appropriate the money in your tribe. And then you go on to install the NNPC, which is the basic cash cow of the country. And the only person you can find to make as chairman is also your tribe man. Like, look, look, I'm not a hater of government. I'm not a hater of Bolatinubu. No, I am not. I'm just a lover of a united Nigeria that works for all Nigeria. And I cannot, you remember how many times I came on an interview in your other platform where I would take on the president of general, Momodu Bari, the president as he was then called. I consider it the height of, you know, being unfair to myself and being unfair to the people that used to listen to me when I was charging the other people to do better for everybody, if I now suddenly become mooted because your brother is the one in charge of the country, take a look at what they're doing. Are you not even feeling like this is disgraceful? Look, you want to run a government and you're telling the world that we need to, we need to you know, shape up in terms of subsidy, we need to shape up in terms of waste, we need to shape up in terms of our fiscal policies and all that. And you don't have the gumption to know, really truly know, that the best way to start getting people to shape up is for you to start to trim the pork from your own diet. You can't be telling me you are putting into 15 million for renovation of a house. Are you like serial billion? You can't be telling me you are buying cars for first lady and all those kinds of things. You can't be telling me the monies you are going to be spending on junketing the whole world looking for what is not lost. You can't be telling me that you are going to <laughs> Dubai to have a conversation on energy cut down, something that as a Nigerian leader is even directly affecting the, the, the things that give you money. If at best they say they want to pay some carbon uh, bills to encourage you, must you go there like frustrated children who have no parents at home? Must you go there with the largest groupings so that when you sit down there, they're looking at you with beggar bows in your hand, all of you looking like Brazil beggar. and UAE has more delegation Please, with than you Nigeria. respect, do you know what Brazil and UAE, do you know the size of the economy? They can afford it. 
They can damn afford it. That the height of what the Brazilians are doing is even the thing that's happening in the Amazon region where they're trying to say, okay, don't cut the trees and all of that. And so because Brazil can do it, Brazil owns a, 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 an airline manufacturing company. They own their own airline. Brazil owns their own oil and gas industry. They're not having any problem. Brazil can feed itself. There's hardly anything you want to eat in Brazil that is really important. If a company wants to manufacture as small as butter for them, you have to come and do it in Brazil. And then you will come to Nigeria at a point where you are telling us that we don't even have money. You have now suddenly reduced this country, this great nation of ours, to a nation that just jumps on every available invitation, carries all sorts of funny characters, people who have no business being there, including your children, to a the process as serious as that. Why should the Nigerian government, the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria at this time, why should he be doing as if he's never gone on a plane or gone to a seminar? Why is he in a hurry to go there? Why, can't, why shouldn't Nigeria even disdain the world for a while and just tell them, look, guys, we're fixing our home, we're reforming ourselves, you guys can have this conversation, send us a report, we'll look at it, or I'll send some people there, or I'll go there light, or I'll go there in a manner that only those that have things to do there. Did all 1,000 something of them have speaking engagements there that needed them to go there? Do you even know the cost of air ticket? Do you know the cost of logistics? Why would the Nigerian government do a program in Nigeria that is going to bring that many people to Abuja to come and talk about anything that is important to do? Why must we be like this? But th th those numbers are not being sponsored by the federal government of Nigeria. So don't listen to the hogwash of that young man that is replying on their behalf and writing crap. Don't let them feed you this kind of thing. These are some things that we know not that let, there are a lot of private interests, civil society interests, media me, interests. Go and bring me an event that you are going to do in Nigeria that will bring that many people from all over the world to come here and then they too they can come and sleep in a hotel, eat our food, do all. Don't you get? Nations are supposed to be saying that we are just as respected or deserving of our own voice and our own narrative as any other nation. So the state of our economy is such that we cannot afford to have a situation where government officials are traveling you around know, the world. You have, to, you have to join it all together. If you are in an austere period, and we are in an austere period, it should reflect everywhere. How do you expect somebody that is buying fuel at sometimes the, the far ends of the north where I've come from, they are buying at 759 and it's really hard on them. How do you expect them to explain to themselves that their leaders are going to have a conversation in Dubai and it takes about 1,000 plus people? Do you know how much that Not all of those numbers are being paid for by government. It's irrelevant. Even the civil society and the private sector, the dangotes that you are mentioning and co and co that we're spending money on such a wasteful venture can spend it on CSR in the country. Better for me is for them to be finding events that people are coming to do here. We're not going to be the weeping boy of the world, and we're even, not going to. We're even if gonna, those conversations affect the livelihood and the existential premise so of, of our nation, the world didn't start being in existence today. And the West cannot come every time to say that it's only the agenda that they are interested in that is the world agenda. We must create our own agendas that we want them to come and discuss here. And if they do not have the ability to come to our country for whatever reason, then we can scale down our cost on going there. I'm not saying we should not attend. I'm just saying that, hey, 1,114 people, those type of people. 1,411. Yeah, 100. Imagine that. Imagine that. Going to that kind of event at this time is not sensible. So I'll take you back to Atiku. Atiku is not done. Atiku is the only one that can answer that question. But I think that Atiku does not have the liberty to say he's just going to go and start sleeping when the nation is bleeding. Nero can't sleep when Rome is burning. So whether Atiku is done or is not done, that's his own. He's going to take that decision by himself. But let nobody push Atiku out. Let nobody insist that Bola will not be done in 2027 and Atiku should be done. If you are talking about the aging process, age affects everybody, including you and me. We're going to be older in another three or four years, so that means we have to be done. People are done when they are truly giving their all. So and people like Atiku still have a whole lot more that they can still. So do. what it tells me, uh, uh, the, the, the the ramification of an analysis being made in your party that this is an Atiku playbook. You put a Shagun show me as the national chairman, and it's an automatic ticket do you know for what? an Atiku in 2027. Do you know what? Because I, do you the, know what? The, the, the the concept in your party is where the presidency go. The opposite side is where the national chairman goes. You know, 
I, I wish I was the kind of person that I can even tell you that if I tell I took to be national chairman, he's going to say, yippee, let's go. I think it's not like that. Have you told him? No, of course not. Does he know? He can't be oblivious to the number of young people that are doing stuff on that matter. And he can't be blind to the fact that I'm concerned. Why have you not told him? Because you are close to him. Uh, very, very. The thing is that... And those who even say he inspired no, no, you to want to no, run. No, no. Look, listen. The thing you must know, if you really want to have a respectable relationship with any leader, is that you must never crowd him or box him into a difficult corner. And you must also never allow yourself to be boxed into a difficult corner. The People's Democratic Party of Nigeria is a big enough party that can accommodate my own desires and my own goals, and I also hope it can accommodate his. I am not one who's telling you that Atiku has decided that he's going to run or he's not going to run. That's not it. I'm the one who's telling you that the party, the vehicle that will carry them into contest must be reformed. And I have a lot of ideas on what I think we need to do. And I think that the first thing that needs to happen is that we need to be fair to ourselves. So this is not Atiku's idea? No, 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 no. It's this not. is your own idea. Totally on my. It's not even my idea. It's the ideas of young people. She, you were, the first time you asked me this question, I said, she, me too. I've just seen it like you. But the, the question is that, that those who say that you are up against the like of Bukola Saraki, whom you have told me that you will beat Boo Black you know if you like. go into a contest. She, you know what I like. So the I'm question actually, is that there are those who believe that a Bukola Saraki is an opposition mm -hmm. in terms of ideology and uh, in the PDP against Atiku. No, that's not true. And that you're building a structure against a Bukola no, no, Saraki no, 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 side no. of the no, of the no, divide. No, that's not true. Let me tell you what I say about Bukola Saraki. He's my senior brother. I have always looked at Bukola Saraki as a successor presidential material after the order of the likes of the Bola Tinubu and Atiku. And I think that being a serial presidential candidate who's contested a few times, it's not really right for you to say he is going to come and reform the party so that then tomorrow he says he wants to run for president. What I believe and what I know is this. Let us have this conversation on how the party should be run. Let us have this conversation around the reform required for this party. And if it means that just by being in the race, the conversation is going to take place at the level it's going to take place. I am up for a debate with them. I'll be happy to have Bukola Saragi, if he really wants to come to the level of running national chairman, to have a debate with me or anybody at that. But he's from the North Central, you are from the South. So, should so the Southwest. The, so, the listen, question is that is it the turn of the South? Should the Southwest be in this party for 25 years and never have an opportunity to be national chairman? We're the only ones that have never had national chairmanship. Not central to be fair has even had more than their fair share of national chairmanship, mm -hmm. and all that talk as to oh the president should go to the north or the president should go to the south. That's not where we are now, in my opinion. In my opinion, we still have about a year to reform our party and design the top coach that is going to pull the other cabin to with such power that more Nigerians can line up behind us. We have tried it; our old ways not worked. We need to open up the party. We need to reform. People need to know that this party is going through a reformation. And the reformation must be such that people can see practical steps being taken to change the way things have been done. And that's the kind of thing I can bring to the table. Would you, change, would you suggest a change of name of PDP? I think that PDP doesn't really need that kind of cosmetic change of name. I think that people are only fixated as to the fact that APC and all of them came together and formed APC. And people are so lazy. They feel that you can defeat the APC with the same strategy that APC has mastered by running three elections. I hold the view that no, you can't. But you need to rebrand. I No, no, no. You need to reform. The secondos believe that the party... He did needs a rebranding a couple of years ago. How much success did they get? Before the 2019 election, he got one of our brothers with I told them this thing is not really going to work like that. And it didn't work. That was even before the 2019, our best outing. I spoke them to life then. And in 2023 now, <laughs> you see... You can't be deceiving humans. The idea of a reform is not for you to keep the bottle on the inside dirty and then paint the outside. No. For you to reform, let me give you some ideas of what we're talking about. First is first. You need to remarket the party to the Nigerian people. But what are you going to market? I insist you need to rewrite your ideological underpinnings that differentiates you from them. That's a lot of research. I'll bring some ideas when we get there. Number two, you need to do a road show around the country to show the people and thank the people and find the cells of PDP that are still alive. Number three, 
you need to do a biometrically stable register for your party that allows any member of the party to be absolutely sure that is a credible, authenticated, fee-paying member of this organization. It is idiotic to think that other organizations have membership registers that are stable and they can pay, but the political party is just a jamboree for everybody to do whatever they like. Number five, you cannot use the election management framework you have used three times and you have failed or have been cheated or have been robbed three times, whatever is convenient for you to accept. You can't take it into this play. I promise you, Sheung, the rule, the playbook of our rivals, the APC, is superior to ours. I know this because I'm interested in these kinds of things. I take what they're doing, I look at it, I subject it to research, and I tell myself, no, 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 no. These people can't continue like this. Let me tell you what they don't see. They have not seen the extent of research that informs the decision of the APC. Question number one, why do you even think that a Southwestern Yoruba man who on paper does not even have as much numbers as a Hausa Fulani man, why will he beat a Hausa Fulani person? Why do you think that it was almost a non-negotiable framework for a Bola Tinubu from the Southwest to pick somebody from the North who is also a Muslim? Why do you think that they had no alternative but to dare the Muslim Muslim ticket? And why did it work? Look, these things, these people may like the title, but they don't know what is required. By the grace of God Almighty, I know what is required. So you are a new order. I am the only other that can help them for now. They can brag all they want. They can pretend if they want. They can deceive themselves if they want. They ain't got anything close to what I'm bringing. You know what Adam Shoshamale described the PDP? He said, Papa deceived Papa again. No, don't and, mind Adam. And, 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 and the, the question is that there is a reputation that PDP has always had. What's that? And the reputation that the APC has labored your party as a party that has brought Nigeria to his knees, that why will Nigeria then now want to look at you in the way of your party? You know, the problem with, you see, the problem with those who manage or mismanage narrative is that they don't have a full idea of the amount of danger they are doing to society. The way, why, have you asked yourself one question? Why is it that after every election the citizens are still angry? I mean, if people are freely giving you their, their votes, after the election, they should be happy. Have you asked yourself, why should a nation that has such a young population with 93 million available plus or minus and maybe 87 million plus or minus collected voters, have you ever asked yourself, why would just a miserable 8 million plus be installing a president? Where were the others on the day of the election? So I'm trying to tell you that what is required now is that the alternative party, the the alternative now in opposition cannot insist that the only way it's going to win an election in this country is by thinking that people just get the message that the APC is not doing well. They've not been doing well since Buhari. He spent the better part of his first time in the hospital, and yet they were still able to cheat their way into 2019. They are not doing very well. They left out more than maybe 48 or 49 percent of the Christian population in the country by not balancing their ticket, taking a Muslim Muslim. And yet they won. There is a reason why that is so. And if you tell me you were being rigged, why is it that at the point of your rigging, there was not a single reaction to show resistance? Why is it that there was no reaction to show resistance? In some of the areas where you would have expected, you see, you need to get it straight. Politics, is, politics and elections are not as unpredictable as people think. They are residual decision-making events. That's what they're called in science. So you imagine that Atukul could be defeated. You mean Atiku could predict Atiku before the election? Atiku could Did you see the, the, no, no, no. Did you see that there's a possibility that Tinubu could defeat Atiku before the election? You know, Shimu, I wish you would go back to some of the interviews I've had and you would have seen how I was very clear that... I, look, there was a phrase I used to use on the inside. I used to say to my people, I cannot find the science to back the enthusiasm because it's not there. So the problem I have is that I can advise them. I can suggest. I can champion their cause. I can wear their jersey. I can stand in the train, in front of the train for them. But there are certain reform actions that needs to take place that you cannot force them to do it unless you're sitting on the chair. And let me be clear. I lose nothing if I'm not their chairman. Mm -mm. Look, the country has become so tribal. The chances that if I want to be governor or want to be senator or want to be house of rent, the chances that I better go to where my Yoruba brothers are is very high. That I am still rushing to say that, look, let's repair it. I'm not repairing it so that we can win or lose. 
I'm repairing it so that we can have a balanced democracy. Let me shock you. In 2015, after they had won, one of the first interviews I had with uh, now former Minister of Information, Lai Mohamed, in your station, in Channel's TV, was that he, after we finished, he said, Shegun, come to this party. Come to this party. This party was made for men like I said, I know. But my fear is that if I depopulate the PDP of even the little I contribute, who am I going to leave the work for? It is very altruistic to stand where I'm standing, how I'm standing. People who know me and who have known my journey and my story will tell you that it's not as easy as that. And it's not because any one person represents the totality of the future hope I'm talking about. No. Anybody that wants to be president of Nigeria under the stable of the PDP has to get one thing straight. We need to look at the numbers. We need to make sure that the party, which is like a train to me, has the head coach packed. And the head coach must be able to draw that. Do you know how closely we were to being beaten by obedience? I even sometimes tell myself that, ah, if the people of that particular ethnic group had not been gaslighted and had not been bullied in certain location, perhaps they even probably beat us in that last outing. Maybe too, we, too, we were cheated in some area, but ours was a whisper. But you, but you saw it coming. Oh, yes. That I, saw, could, could lose. I saw it coming. Go and take the clip of my interview with Yori Folari. I had that interview on TV. He invited me one day to come and have an interview. And I said, okay, I will come. She said, well, let me tell you what. I do not have a bone of deceit when I'm talking in me. Better not to ask me a question if you don't want an answer. But if you do ask me the question, whether it's on air in private, I'll tell you the answer as I see it. You know why? Because I'm brave like that. So you saw that there's oh, a yeah. possibility oh, yeah. the article not should lo could not lose. Not only did I see that we were going to lose or the chance of our losing was very high, I also saw five minutes after we finished, after we lost that election, that it's going to be a tall order to do what we wanted to do, even with the courts. It didn't mean that I will not defend the party. So were, were there people deceiving Atiku Abubakar? No, don't use oh. the word deceiving. You see, I, one of the problems I have with oh. one of the problems I have with this narrative style that is employed in this country, rather than blame APC and Bola Tinubu, you single out Bola Tinubu, the president. Rather than blame APC and Momodu Bwari, you single out Momodu Bwari. Rather than blame the country itself and the citizens who have shortchanged themselves by their decision or indecision in 2023, you want to hold Atiku responsible. What's Atiku supposed to do more than make himself available, go to campaigns according to the design of those who were designing whatever they were designing, and make himself you know, respectable, dignified, to be able to be in the space? Do you know what it takes to lose an election and to get up the next day in the morning? I don't expect people that are in the country who are now living a life that is less than the quality that they even had hoped. I don't expect them to be saying, Atiku, this Atiku, the Atiku is somebody that you all need to be clapping for because most people can't even walk in his shoes. So you see him as a hero? I see him as someone who is scarred a lot by the contribution to help us have a democratic stability in this country. And if that is what you define as a hero, then I think that, like I always say, the praise is not for the man who sits on a chair and is criticizing or doesn't do anything. It's for the man who dates himself and first up, gets up again, falls down, gets up again, falls down, gets up again. Do you even imagine for a second that if there was no an article, maybe you will not even have a June 12. Have you talked for a second that if there was no article, you wouldn't even have an economic council that says the vice president is the chairman? Have you talked for a second that even if people like Atiku were not there, you may not even have an alternative political party? Can you imagine if rabble rousers were the ones who were in charge, who were prone to violence or putting people on the street to be doing his country and all of those things that can just make the whole country ugly. Can you imagine for a second if Atiku followers were just a little bit behaving like the Peter Obi people, the obedient, who have no, there's nobody that is too big for them to insult. Would you see the people of PDP doing that? No king, no leader, everything is just so, you know, dramatically toxic. They're practically fighting every day. I understand the concept of the glass ceiling. Maybe they may want to know. They didn't bring Gobi out. People like me did. I know how many times I visited Anambra and Nemo and all of those areas, screaming that I think that there's going to, we need to shatter this glass ceiling. Let us create an Igbo politician that is going to be pan-Nigeria. Peter cannot tell me that he went to buy form on his own. Do you know how many times I visited him, dragging a Kunibe to come and begging that, okay, let's just buy the form so you can just go around the country and we can create another pan-Nigerian person. So you were oh, responsible, yes. responsible to uh, Peter Obi's emergence he in can, national he politics. He can debate me if he wants. For the presidency, I I was the one who even went to even inform Atiku that look, he's going to buy the form because what I was seeing, Shewu, is this: I was seeing a scenario where how do we now, 
how do we have a nation where the numbers indicate that we should be able to be a bit more equitable? And I know that politics is a game of number. People have to vote and revote. Do you understand? And I was thinking to myself that we have a duty to create another pan-Nigerian Igbo person. Are the maker and Yao could still be young? It would have fitted the bill of an evil person that Nigerians can at least take that risk and trust. And I felt that they were too insular and too, they were staying too much in their comfort zone. If Dave Umayi, the now minister of um, is it, uh, works, if Dave Umayi had been in the PDP, if he hadn't left, that was one material that I was thinking, yes, this is the guy I'm going to back. Because I was just looking for someone who we could bring his actions, what he had done, his activities, who would speak the language, who would just give the Nigerians the impression that don't be unnecessarily afraid of us, the Igbos. We're not going to do anything crazy. We're still going to work for this whole country. And I felt that David Mayen had that credential. And I still believe he has. I don't know how he's going to do as minister now. And I've never spoken to him ever in my life. I'm sure he doesn't even know me like that. Or maybe he does from TV. But that was a man that I was looking for. Unfortunately, you think that, you think the reason is that for some people in court not to al uh, not to allow in their minds the Igbos or to, politician in, is because they don't trust them. No, no, no. See, if you don't have a pan-Nigerian disposition, you can't win from. Now, Ebola Tinubu could not have won one, one, one that election from the southwest. Atiku can't win it from the north. Nobody can win from their zone. So, for you to be able to win the presidency of Nigeria. You need to have the type of disposition that a greater number of the Nigerians will say, okay, I'm willing to hedge a bet on this. And you cannot direct your narrative of winning an election in such a manner that is too combative. Sheung, how much abuses would I start giving a kitty before you start getting angry? Even though I know you don't go there like all the time, you're basically a tri the tribalized Nigerian like me. But sometimes, you know, these things go deep into the skin. It's like calling somebody's father's name and just, you know, abusing them and abusing them and abusing them. They may take a bit, but you will begin to offend them. So if we must do this with democracy, we must figure out a way to build bridges. And Can an Igbo man ever rule this country? Very easily. Very easily. Look, imagine Yemi Oshibadu, who was vice president, former vice president, Somebody sitting in the church praying or doing something in, in, in this music, and they made him vice president of Buhari. And within the space of each other, look at how he shone like a million stars. Can you imagine for a second if we had been lucky and we had been able to make Peter be vice president so that people can see even this uh, when you go to Malaysia, you go to Indonesia, people can see it practical. Talk is cheap. Sometimes when I look at the things that Peter is saying, I must say myself, does Peter even know what he's talking about at all? If you can reduce Peter to somebody who will just say, I want to come and do anti-corruption, no more. You won't get any fine idea in all of the other areas, except to say that I will carry my bag, I will not buy ticket. Yes, after that, what next? So I was thinking that if we could make him a pan-Nigerian, go around the whole country like he has done, he has achieved some things, then maybe if God made it easy, he sit there, we give him the country and there's somebody that is a president. People can understand that nobody is trying to make Biafra out of the presidency of Nigeria. But you can't have a situation where they are saying they want out, they're killing themselves in the southeast, and their people are fighting everybody, and then you expect that people are not going to be just a tad nervous. Why should you get why should they give you their free will to lead them if you are not going to show at least that you are all one and the same? And it's not his fault. I think it's the mismanagement of the possible war narrative. Somehow, somewhere, I think that we have not, we never really dealt with that issue. And I think that it's down to the limited capacity of the people who got us out of the civil war. Because they should have known that finishing a war does not finish the healing. You need to be able to deal with it and heal. If we need to say sorry, we need to say sorry. If we need to pay compensation, we need to pay compensation. You can't be standing in 1967 or 70, how many years after? And you're seeing from the way the engagements are going and there's still a problem that has not been resolved. And a generation of people who can tell you the real things that happen, they are turning out. How do you resolve that? Look, very simple. You can do a specialized panel where you tell the people to come and bring their issues. If they feel that they didn't get compensation for the houses they have, you can put a cost to it. You can, there are always ways. You can even admit that you were wrong. 
You can admit that so many of them died as a result of starvation and that is a bad policy, it's crime against humanity, and say, we're sorry. And you can say, going forward, this is it. And you can put laws in place that says, in this country, either on social media or real media, nobody's going to allow you to start you know, heating up the polity to the point that you're trying to start xenophobic attacks on yourself. Nations are not left to just every, every wind to be carried all over the place. People are in charge of this infrastructure of government. People are in charge of the DSS. People are in charge of NIA. Would, People are in charge of national You think that would fix the secessionist uh, tendency? Yes, it, it could. It could. It could. Look, actually, three men, three brothers, Razikwe, Awolo, and Tababalewa, you know, why should they call it the article of independence? And so many years down the line, the Igbos are feeling that there's a glass ceiling on their head. Some of the aggressions you even see is as a result of them trying to do a bit of a pushback. Maybe sort of like saying, oh, we won't allow you to step on us. You need to hug your brothers. You need to let them know that I'm not trying to step on you. If you're doing something that I don't like, the fact that I say I don't like it from you does not mean I'm talking to the entire race. And you need to respect my race as well. You will need to stop all these useless languages and names you call yourself that is offensive. Why should it be the greatest black nation in the world? That is the hope of all the black men. Why should they be a dog at truth to themselves? So that's a major blockade for an Igbo presidency. No, no, no. I, I don't know. Things are changing. No, don't, don't get me wrong. Things are changing. If they continue to stimulate the conversation and they take on board some of this suggestion and they don't start abusing everybody, even for offering some suggestion, why would you not want it to happen? Uh, let me ask you, who is funding me? your ambition? So uh, the ambition has not even started. The little bit I can do, I can see fund that for myself. So you've known me for years. Which day have you ever seen me come to your studio where my car is broken and wearing tattered clothes? I'm asking because of those who think no, that no, 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 no. this 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 funding and this support is coming from Atiku. Oh God! No, okay. no, no. You guys, you, do you guys listen? Do not. I. I'm not. I'm not under obligation. I don't even hate Wiki. I don't hate Wiki. I've told people over and over again, I've not gotten over from the fact that I can't even find him in the party. Let me tell you one thing that will, that will interest you, Shil. While I was going around the north, you know when you talk, you will hear. <laughs> I could not imagine the level of testimonials that people were giving me about this guy called Wilson Wiki in PDP. They gave me one testimonial at one location. I was just like, wow, is that true? Let me tell you the testimonial. They said to me that they had a problem. They couldn't pay a certain rent. Of the party and that total amount of money was about 250 million which they were supposed to pay because they paid five years and that the guy that needed wanted the property wanted his money so bad and i had gone to pack you know this big uh brothers this construction stuff that is going to just dump it in front of the blind nobody will go out nobody will go in so he spoke to somebody which i don't want to mention because i didn't take permission to, to share the story and he said the guy now said okay if you don't give me 10 million out of my money tomorrow money i'm not doing again so he said, he started, he called people like, let us put the money together, nobody will answer. He even called governors, oh, nobody will answer. As a last resort, I'm not talking about now, I'm talking about the wicked that was wicked. They called him. After, hey, what is going on? What is going on? And he spoke. He said, okay, will the person take part payment? He said, the person will take part payment. They are looking for 10 million. He said, the person, they told him total fee. He said, the person will take part payment. The man told me the story himself. He said, he said okay, come in 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Guess what the guy told me? The guy told me that by 10 o'clock the next day in the morning, Wiki was the one that was standing right there in front of him. He didn't have to call him. He had arrived at the location himself. I told him that. Eh, I'm here, I'm here. And then when he came, I just said, take. And when they checked what he had done, he had provided the logistics for $150 million to pay part of the debt and put a promise that I'll pay the remaining in nine days because the end of the month was nice. and I'll pay in nine days. The man told me that, do I know what is so remarkable? That when they gave the person that they were owing the money, that money, the guy was happy. He would have been even been happy to go away for the next two, three years because it's actually yearly. But they just like to pay five years so they can have some breather. The guy told me, the man told me, the elderly man told me, he said, you know what? He said, on the last day of the month, in the morning, he didn't have to call him. That the guy was on a call and said, eh, where are you, where are you? And then, he cleared that upset. So I told him that, okay, it's not because he's governor. He said, no. He said, Shegu, you are missing the essence of the story. I got the essence. I just wanted to probe what was the essence of the testimonial. He said, no, you are missing the essence. It's not money. It's the fact that when he gives his word, you can build a house on it. Hmm. 
and that he keeps he will keep his word he will keep he will keep his word and all i was doing was going around the country thanking people for the next election begging them not to be angry asking them how can we reform the party and naturally i will hear things and i can tell you am i a wicked man is vk not even but will you be willing to work with him to to be the chairman have i not to, to work with you have i you know the problem with going up now go now you saw is that Nobody can tell you precisely where he is now. But he's, it, he, he said it in the interviews with him. I know. That but he's, you know, he's, he's a PDP he's man. It's a little bit complicated. When VK was a PDP. But can you take away the fact that PDP still hold a very good fraction? Yes, I know. In the structure of the I'm PDP not right arguing. now. What I'm, I'm not arguing. I know who he is more than you. What I'm telling you is that, you see, when VK was the VK of PDP, this APC people, they would have run out of town. If VK is doing budget, he's going to attack them. If VK is doing press conference, good. VK was the champion that was helping us to take the fight to them. Okay, since he has been quiet, show me the replacement. How many governors, living, serving governors of PDB, have even attempted to even say, I am here, leader of opposition? Nobody gave VK that title. He just filled the gap. And yes, I don't like a lot of things. But there are arguments on both sides. Should anybody come to a negotiation table and be living with zero? So I'm trying to tell you, Shewo, I'm not a psychophantic parochial person. I see the greater objective for the party. And let me tell you, I've told the PDP in some locations that gentlemen, be careful. Better men have founded parties that have gone into oblivion. Where's the party of Aulawo? Where's the party of Azikwe? Where's the party of uh, 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 PRP or Rimi? Political parties must be nurtured. They must be reinvented. They must passion must go into it. They must be true to their own ideology. How can a political party willfully disobey its own constitution and then have a plateau of cases all over the place? Look at the mess we are dealing with in in plateau. You can't be in opposition and be doing that. You need to smell the coffee. Between 1999 and 2011, all of us in the country were running the parties and elections on a binary money chasing numbers pb does not know that what significantly changed for apc is that somewhere along the line they came in contact with those who know how to plan and they introduced the science of election to them so pdp is still running money chasing number whereas apc is already money science numbers and i know this playbook we're not where i know the people that when they are talking in terms of election management in the strategy but that i will respect in this country but they themselves will definitely respect me in terms of my ability and my understanding of the process. Let's I go anywhere and everywhere in the world just to learn. Let's wrap up this way. <laughs> you have not even asked us about the federal government. You are wrapping up. That what is, are we wrapping that, up on? That, that is where I want us to anchor. Show me you have done we, it. We, we spent over an hour here. Okay. <laughs> and it doesn't look, when, whenever I'm having a conversation with you, it doesn't look Show like we spent a my, minute. You are my natural interviewer. <laughs> You're brilliant. You don't do like you want to throw your guest under the table. You are a quintessential journalist and I Thank respect you. what you do. Thank you. On. you are That's why we flow. You are very articulate too. Thank and you. I'd like us to wrap up in this manner. How do you assess this Tenobu government? It spent how many months since May? Do you see a hope? They said they're selling a renewed hope to Nigerians. Do you see a hope? Do you see light at the end of the tunnel? Do you believe in this Tenobu government? At all? You know, I've reflected on them well and reflected on them much. And the only thing I can say is that whatever it is that they say they are calling their policy, the only people that that policy will work for are probably the southerners. When you are talking about spending a lot of energy on uh, uh, startup capital, all of these things, you're still speaking to a small fraction of the society. They are attitude around money, the way they're throwing their weight all over the place, the way they're just spending money like drunken sailors, is not a reflection of what I expect for a government that is trying to like fix the country and give it a lead. So I think that I have concluded that nothing good will come out of their, their, their Nazareth and that at the end of the day they will spend their four years or whatever time God has given them to make themselves richer to make themselves bigger and probably leave the country more miserable. For you to be able to solve the problem of Nigeria, the underpinning philosophy of your budgeting must be we are budgeting for the poor. When you say you are budgeting for the poor, it means you are figuring out how will the poor eat. 
How would the poor get to the hospital? How would the poor get accommodation? Oh, sorry, how would the poor get accommodation where they will sleep? How would the poor get education? If you start thinking from that mindset of let us budget for the poor, you know what will happen? You will cover more people in your space. And in any case, the rich can find their own way. What I see them doing is they are budgeting for themselves, they are rich friends, they are wives, they are numerous hanger ons there are legislators who need new cars all the time, themselves who need a yacht, uh, there are uh, uh, logistics of traveling, the Esther code. It, it, they are not serious. They are, you are a nation that is in debt thinks that by not showing even potential you know, people that can give them more money or even forgive them or invest in their country, that they have the ability to be frugal and spend money better, that people are just going to keep dashing their money. They must think the world for a fool. Even what they are doing in the oil and gas industry is quite unbelievable. The, 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 what we are hearing there with all the, our partners is not palatable. No new investment but significantly is coming in and we are not able to show that even anybody who wants to give us money, we are going to use it well or we are going to use it judiciously. You can't carry a bunch of people to hunger who have not recovered from that. You've come back home. You are building houses and renovating houses for yourself. I saw great plan. We have not recovered from that. You've gone to uh, Dubai to go and talk about climate change. It's uh, 1,000 plus people. We have not recovered from that. What do we know you are going to do over Christmas? You are spending money as if it's running out of fashion. They forget that for you to be able to stimulate you know, the energies you need for the country, you need to also show that you are not putting a burden on the people in terms of removing subsidy and all of the comfort that the people can enjoy, whereas you yourself are living life. If you cut down on your expenses, if you made a memo and said no new cars for the next two years, we'll use the one in the pool. If you pretended that you didn't want to go everywhere in the world with 1,000 people, we'll just go with the minimal number of people that have a business being there, we'll be fine. If you started to show that even from where you're standing, you're going to sweep the floor, you'll find out that Nigerians are not that hostile. It's just that it's difficult for you to tell the Nigerian people that underneath the circumstances that will come down, they need to go and do, they need to spend a lot of effort on massive reorientation of this country. We have a reorientation challenge that if they come on the table, we can share some ideas with them. I do not believe that the business of opposition is wishing the ruling party not to succeed. No. I believe that the business of opposition is encouraging them to succeed so that they can do some part of the job so that by the next opportunity when we come with better ideas, better attitude, and better inclusivity for the people, then we'll meet the glass half full. Do you think they have the capacity? Ordinarily, if they, if they push themselves of their, you know, back to where you're just dancing and doing a one bit all over the place, and they began to be a bit more serious, and they stop taking the Nigerian people for granted, they should be able to have the capacity. Human capital is not our problem in this country. We have the brain power to think ourselves out of any problem. The problem is that do we have the political will or do we have the government leadership discipline to go that route? But you don't trust them. Nobody should. You shouldn't in your own interest. Why, why not? Look at them now. In, they've removed the subsidy from the first day. They've not even been able to determine themselves for themselves how much they're going to pay workers take home fee. They have reduced everybody into co in the country into people that need palliatives. And they do not think that, okay, if you put the cart before the horse, six months is a long time for you to be putting the horse back in the space. You know what I mean? They are telling you they don't have money. They are buying cars for themselves. They are buying for their wives. They are buying yards. They are spending more. They are telling, you know, no, shame, shame. I want a Nigerian president that tells the world that here we are, Nigeria. We run on our own terms. I want a Nigerian president that sells the world that for the next two years, our greater problem is working on the inside, sorting out our own agriculture, finishing our dislocations that is causing us to kill ourselves, stabilizing and having a conversation on restructuring if it is a necessary conversation, looking at our own anti-corruption ex effort and exercise, becoming a nation of consequence, where when people do things, there are consequences, and no matter how highly placed the person, there will be a consequence, and then we can then tell the world, here we are, we're open for business. I've never known any society that didn't close up to emerge as a successful nation. China closed up for a while before it became great. Japan did the same thing. 
Dubai too busied itself and put its nose to the ground stone until it become a destination where everybody is going to. When would Nigeria look itself in the mirror and tell itself that there are no messiahs outside of Nigeria that will save Nigeria, that the people that will save Nigerians are the Nigerians themselves, and that the responsibility of a leader is to walk the talk and act the script that is telling the people. Your communication cannot be telling people you don't have money, and then your lifestyle will be extremely extravagant. So I don't trust them. Are you also afraid? Because some of some of your friends within the opposition are afraid that there is a coastal takeover of the entire system. No, you should know that it's not a coastal takeover; a complete takeover of the. You know what they call state capture. You look at the the executive; they've taken that. Yeah, that's normally entitled if they win an election. Look at the legislature. Forget about the fact that the APC people are even in the majority. Is that the reason why all the opposition members in the opposition are just there to be doing yes sir, yes sir to them? How can they go into the hollow chambers of the, of the Senate in a joint session and be singing on your mandate? What kind of mandate is that? A mandate that is suspect and people are sitting down there, the opposition could not even walk out, could not even use their voice, could not even protest. So that's that. What about the judiciary? People have asked me that, is it that it is only the lawyers of the APC that went to law school? Because suddenly it appears as if it's only the position of the lawyers of the APC that is correct in this country, and the, the position of the other people's lawyers are not correct. And everybody has become so cowed to the point that people are just anticipating, ah, let us not talk, oh, let us not say, ah, maybe we'll have a case in court, oh. maybe the, the judiciary should be a place where when you come to court, you don't need to be afraid of your bullies. The person you have taken to court, you have taken him to court. You should be assured that the court will look at the case and do what it needs to do. And like I always tell people, that you lose in court does not mean the judiciary is corrupt. No, I don't accept that argument. The argument I, I take is the judiciary cannot be making their slips and expect society that is already agitated to clap for them. You can't write the judgment of Kano the way you wrote it. That's unacceptable. And you can't have a set of laws or interpretation of status that is a bit confusing. What even constitutes a pre-election matter now? Because in one case, you say it's a pre-election matter, it has no locus here. And in other cases, you say it can be both pre-election and you know, post-election matter. So we need to clean up everywhere where the malady that has infected our society, be it corruption, be it nepotism, it has infected, affected everywhere. And unfortunately, we cannot clean it from the base. We have to clean it from the head so that the head will give instruction to the base. If governors and everybody is coming to Abuja for a check to run their state, then it means that there's still some leverage in the presidency to show the way, a change of attitude and what needs to happen. And I think if we're able to accept that, we have a right to be hopeful and that the work that needs to go into that hope is the work of all of us, not the work of the poor and the rich are supposed to be smiling dancing happy and without empathy with the way the rich is spending money or the leadership of the country is spending money you need to ensure that god did not put poor people in this country so that they can be clapping for the rich we have a duty to make sure that our budgeting process is a budgeting process that is budgeting to cater for the things that affect the poor that's what i'll say chief otumba check with me it's a pleasure having this conversation always with you a pleasure on the mic on Thank you so much. Thank indeed. you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank pleasure. you so much. And that is it. My chat with Shedman Shawumi. And I do hope you get his views on these issues. And you also have your own views about some of the issues raised on the podcast today. Don't forget that you can share, follow, and subscribe to our YouTube page. And follow us on all our social media platforms. Thank you indeed, everyone, for watching. I'm Sean Wakimale. I'll see you again. Bye-bye. Hello everyone and welcome. This Thank you for joining us on this edition of Mike on Podcast with Shayono Kimbaloy. Mike on